and I didn't know then that I know now, and that's one of the reasons why I'm sober. Main reason is because I always underestimated the opponent that I was up against because I possessed that job that consisted of knowing everything. I never gave my addiction or my alcoholism the time, attention, and respect it fucking deserved. Mm -hmm. Hence, of course, it saw me coming a mile away and was like, ah, here comes this bitch again. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to fucking rape him every mm -hmm. which way but Sunday. And when I when I got beaten to a bloody pulp, mm -hmm. right, demoralized in just such a fashion from drugs and alcohol that I was left in the worst place that I could have ever imagined. With myself, by myself, forced to focus on myself alone. Welcome to the Hell Has an Exit podcast with host Teddy Tarantino. New episodes every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget to subscribe. Okay, guys, welcome to Hell Has an Exit. I'm your host, Brian. And today we have a special guest. I'm super excited. I was looking at your uh, YouTube video last night and watching it and uh, very inspiring. I've been watching you since I was a kid. I'm a CKY fan. So excited to have you on the podcast. Welcome, Brandon Novak. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I apologize for all the years <laughs> of my bullshit that you endured coming up. That's probably why you ended up in recovery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, but Jackass was uh, a pinnacle thing of like my childhood that it was like, I remember getting a little camera and we would be like, yeah, let's do Jackass stunts. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a common theme, man. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this is good. I'm looking forward to today. Uh, unfortunately, we've gotten so deep into so many different conversations <laughs> already and nothing's been rolling. Yeah. So hopefully we can kind of bring it back mm -hmm. to several things that we've been talking about. But we share a lot of similarities on the way we look at things, I believe. It's important to me to have guests on the show that are 12 step guys because there's so much rhetoric on the Internet. And I'm not saying actually it's not rhetoric. There's a lot of people that don't have that view and I respect their view. But I do think that uh, sometimes like people who are in 12 step meetings or 12 step when it's in the public eye, it's kind of talked about like in a mocking way and people are like, oh, I don't do those meetings or whatever. But there's so many people that do. And because of anonymity, they might not come out and say it. But now with, you know, technology and stuff like that, there's a way to talk about recovery and still have respect to the traditions. And I think it's important that we get people talking about that it does work for a lot of people. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I, a, a lot of people would say that I am fucking not abiding by the traditions. And maybe <laughs> I am, maybe I'm not. Um, but I had a sponsor once that said to me that I am not, nor will I ever mm -hmm. be important enough to destroy this whole thing that's mm -hmm. been going on for fucking decades and decades and decades. Mm -hmm. Meaning that like people evolve, mm -hmm. things change. Um, I, as an addict, all that means is I'm defiant by nature. I mm -hmm. hate authority and I refuse to conform <laughs> because I possess this job and this job places me in a lot of positions I don't like to be in and it allows me to feel a lot of feelings I don't like to feel. And that job consists of knowing everything. Mm -hmm. So when you tell me what I need to do, I tell you why you need to fuck off. But if you can kind of deliver your whole deal in a way that I find so attractive so desirable and, and so appealing that I like want to fuck it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm now willing to do anything that I have to to get what you have, then my life's going to change. Mm -hmm. Meaning give this thing away through attraction, not mm -hmm. promotion. It's a You have to subtly kind of give it to me in a way that I buy into mm -hmm. it. So therefore, I use my platforms in that manner. Yeah, I always say uh, you're never going to get a rubber you know, chew toy out of a pit bull unless you give it a juicy steak. Straight up. So it's gotta be better than what you got now. And yeah. a lot of people try to wrestle the pit bull and with an addict, we're just gonna bite down harder and harder. But if you offer us something better than the rubber toy, now we're like- Show me a reason mm -hmm. why I wanna buy in. I'll let go on my own. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can't tell me. So mm -hmm. understanding that, again, we're defiant, hate yeah. authority, refuse to conform, it's just a sleight of hand card trick kind of mm -hmm. deal. But bringing it back to the whole 12 step thing, I don't, I'm a man in recovery. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a 12 step guy. I, I have a home group I attend every Saturday morning. I sponsor gentlemen, I have a sponsor. Um, all that, you know, I feel like I'm fucking giving an AA talk right mm -hmm. now. But the truth of the matter is, um, I, I own a treatment center, I own sober living houses. Mm -hmm. 
but everyone in my day to day, whether it, in in my business relationships, mm-hmm. I don't deal with unless they work a twelve step program. Mm-hmm. I, I don't because then I what I've learned is that the ones that don't, not saying all of them, but more so than not, unfortunately, are financially incentivized, mm-hmm. or they have like an agenda. My my financial uh, my 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 financial advisor, my real estate agent, my business partner, mm-hmm. uh, my are all twelve step people. Mm-hmm. Like I can trust them. Yeah, and it's like even with my employees, I see that like obviously I can't make it mandatory that you have to work a program to be an employee, but it's not coincidental that a lot of the employees that I have issues with haven't been to meetings in years. Right. It just makes it a lot easier when they are. And it's like meetings aren't the – they don't have a monopoly on therapy and stuff like that, but it's like you got to be doing something to want to, to better you. to have the awareness yeah. of your own defects and not to be in the victim state because in my opinion it's like that's our natural state is the victim mentality and if i don't do something on a daily basis to get out of that that's what i resort to for sure i wake up one of two ways every day depending <laughs> on the day don't you know who the fuck i am or please god don't ask me who i am <laughs> you know what i mean like i'm always trying to find that natural balance prime example i was driving last night going to visit a friend in her community, which I didn't know, and I'm running behind, and I'm going a bit faster than I should have been, and I went down the wrong way, and I came up the wrong way, and this woman comes running out of her house, frantic, stops my car, and I I stop, and she said, are you lost? I said, yeah, I kind of am. Don't you know you're going up a one-way wrong? No, Mm -hmm. I don't. This is a community, and I said, look, I apologize. Mm-hmm. I am sorry. I hope that I am not offending you too much. <laughs> it, like she was just, Live and she it. just stared at me. If looks could kill, like wanted something more from this. Mm-hmm. The reality is, is, look, it's a mistake. I apologize. Mm-hmm. Let's move on here. <laughs> you know? Yeah, most people don't. She even, didn't have a twelve step program, <laughs> of course, dude. And they're so, like, even when people are driving crazy. I don't know if there's an emergency going on. I don't know what these people no are going doubt. through. Bro, you know how many times I've been driving uh, balancing a crack pipe? You know what I mean? Like, I don't... <laughs> even when people, like, fuck up food and people get so mad at the waiters, I'm like, bro, have you worked in a restaurant? Those Straight people up. are on drugs. <laughs> Dude, I, I much prefer to come mm-hmm. from a place of understanding as opposed to being understood. Mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, I love being right-sized by the world. Mm-hmm. This happened the other day. Thank God for moments like this. I, I live in a, in a pretty nice area in the city of Philadelphia, and there's a Starbucks on the corner, and I go in there, and I'm late for a meeting. Right? Mm-hmm. I have this important meeting, and uh, people were waiting for me, and it's a pretty big deal. And, and, and I get my tea, and I'm waiting to go to the bathroom, and no one's coming out of the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Now, my fucking alcoholic mind created this delusional narrative that I really was buying into. Mm-hmm. No one's coming out of the bathroom. They're taking forever. Someone's in there getting high. They don't give a fuck about my schedule. Mm-hmm. I'm now late for this meeting. I'm going to lose the deal. The mm-hmm. property's going to go to... I snowball effect into this. Now, 18 minutes later, I'm still waiting because I refuse to leave, mm-hmm. right? My pride, my ego's like, I'm fucking waiting to see who's in this mm-hmm. bath. I'm convinced someone's in there getting high, could care less about anything that I have going on or life. Mm-hmm. Fucking 22 minutes later, counting the minute by the second, the door starts to jimmy open. I'm like, here we go. (laughs) Fucking so high they can't even open the door. Mm -hmm. Barely gets it open. And then I see like a crutch come out. And then it like jimmies the door open Mm -hmm. and then another one. And a fucking paraplegic guy comes like jimmying. And I'm like, how fucking dare me? Mm -hmm. Right? Like how dare me? like have the gall Mm -hmm. to think that like you know like fuck me Mm -hmm. really yeah fuck me (laughs) i'm a big four agreements guy and yeah um, like don't make assumptions yeah dude i really don't know what this person is going through i don't know why they're taking long and even at meetings like when i probably like two years clean i used to get mad at people texting in meetings and stuff and i'll never forget i was at this meeting this guy was on his phone and raising his hand. So I'm like, bro, you can't be <laughs> scrolling on your phone How dare and you? raising your hand. This crackhead with eight years sober so knows mad. the fucking yeah, ethics. Yeah, bro, we have rules here. <laughs> like, fuck. Like, last year, you guys were fucking smoking crack, but now you got to yeah, act yeah, with some yeah, etiquette. Totally. And I was so angry, and he got picked. And then he waited to finish, like, what he was doing on oh, his phone. Yeah. And I was just like, dude, this motherfucker. And I didn't know, dude. 
he was reading the basic the text on uh-huh, his phone totally. and he's like oh it says here on page da 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 and i didn't know that he was following along in the book on his phone yeah you just create and i don't know if narrative. someone has a sick kid for sure and now i'm just like man i try not to make assumptions straight up and when i do i normally just trick myself into a story that's not real yeah these delusional narratives that mm-hmm. come from the most problematic place ever for mm-hmm. an addict or an alcoholic, which is the yeah. brain, the thing that lies between these two ears, mm-hmm. right? The drinking and the drugging is not our problem, it's the thinking, mm-hmm. the attitude and the behavior. Yeah. So it's like, I have to remember that everyone is sick in their own right. Mm-hmm. Like, you might have cut me off at the red light and although I wanna fucking murder you, maybe I'm not privy to the fact that you just got a call that your mother was killed in an accident mm-hmm. and you're rushing to the hospital. Like, we all have shit going on. It blows my mind that like, more people don't crash. Yeah. Like. I, like I've been on my phone so much and driving, I've never been on a crash like uh, crash and killed someone. Thank God! But it's like it blows my mind that you don't really need much to drive a car. I know it's, it's like, like you took deadly. You, you took a test because I I'm a I'm a gun guy. Mm. So people are always like, aren't you scared you're gonna like shoot yourself or something? I'm like, no, dude. You guys get in cars every day. Like you have no idea what state all these. Think about all the thousands of people that are driving at 80 miles an hour that with the turn of the wheel Florida is a big everyone. one. Yeah. They fucking, there was They're a crazy. big accident I saw here on the way. Mm-hmm. Like a big, dude, you know, I'm 45 years old. I got sober uh, and when I got sober at 30, when I'm sober coming up on nine years, mm-hmm. uh, 38 or whatever it was, I didn't have a driver's license. I'd never had a driver's license mm-hmm. ever in my life. I got my learners at 16 and then it expired because I found heroin and who needs to do that? <laughs> and I would, you know, just buy cars, total cars, borrow your car, total mm-hmm. to her car. And so in Maryland, my license was suspended, although I never had a license. So whenever I got pulled over, say I was driving on mm-hmm. a suspended license, only had a learners. Nonetheless, Maryland felt that it was best that I'd never be allowed to have a license. Mm-hmm. So Maryland would not allow me a license. In Pennsylvania, where I live, they said once my third DUI driving on suspension was lifted, I could get my license. So at 38, I get my first ever license. But prior 38, to- 38, you got your first license Never ever? had a license in my life. Wow. People were like, Novak, we never thought you would get sober, but a license and an insured <laughs> car with your name on it, we're going to throw mm-hmm. you a fucking block party, mm-hmm. right? Um, but I would have these dreams prior to getting my license that- um, and, and very vivid, real dreams. And it scared me away from getting my license mm-hmm. to prove your point. I'd come to in a jail cell. I'd wake up and I'd bang on the door. CO, CO, wh- wh- what am I doing here? Mm-hmm. And the CO would look at me and say, you don't know? And I'm like, no. And he said, you were in a, an accident last night and you hit a minivan head on and killed a family of four. Because I had woken up in a lot of jail cells with no idea what I did to get there. Mm-hmm. And like I envisioned with a car, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I would just nod out and just like that I was like scared to yeah. actually like get a car. Wow. So I can respect what you're saying. Yeah. And that has happened. I know. You know, people I, did, I've woken, I mean, I've woken up in so many jail cells. Like what happened? Mm. And if they would have told me that, I would have believed it. Yeah. So I was like, dude. Maybe I shouldn't drive. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I don't know problem shooting speedballs all day, but yeah. maybe I shouldn't drive. Mm-hmm. And I was also scared of smoking crack. Mm-hmm. You never like, smoke crack? I would, but like if you attempted to give me a hit, I'd be very weary of it. Because gotcha. I was like, dude, at the end, I couldn't come up with 10 bucks once mm-hmm. a day for a bag of dope, let alone like every five minutes for a blast. <laughs> so I'm like, dude, I'm I'm cool with yeah. that shit. Well, wow, it's interesting. Um, All right, let's try to get into like the beginning of your story. So I was watching your, and like, I had watched CKY and been like a Jackass fan and all this stuff. I didn't know how young you got your skateboarding deal. Yeah. Like that blew my mind. Cause, cause honestly, like when I would, you know, when I think of like Tony Hawk and you know what documentary changed, not changed my, well, I guess it did change my life. The Christian Hasoy one. Yeah. I watched it when I had like a year clean. Yeah. And I remember just being like, it was just like, Poosh. that's my guy now. Wow. He's fucking, that's my, he, he's an amazing artist and he gave mm-hmm. me a lot of art for my facility. Wow. Uh, I you do, have Christian Hasoy art at your facility. Yeah. And thing. he's, he's found God. He's, he's yeah, found yeah. religion. Mm-hmm. So he's given me a, which is funny because I, I started praying way more after i read that no way i saw his documentary his documentary i was like do you read his book no his book is really good good. too dude check it out yeah i'm gonna tell him that he will love to hear that oh dude i get so stoked i make when i was attacking treatment i would be like dude watch this christian soy doc i was i used to push it hard yeah i I didn't know him then but i I met him after i got sober and we started doing these events called punk rock and paintbrushes tour great i love he's my guy wow 
I don't know what we're talking about. But the, <laughs> <laughs> you smoking crack again? Yeah, no. Uh, no, the childhood and like when yeah. I started skating and yeah. So I I was blessed to find this a skateboard found my hands at a young age. My sister would go to Ocean City, Maryland every mm-hmm. summer. She'd live down there and. I had no desire to want to skate, never thought about skating. And I believe we're all given these God given talents, Mm -hmm. but you know, unfortunately a lot of us don't experience what that is. Like Mm -hmm. you might be the best ping pong player in the world, but God might not see fit to put a pad on your hand. Mm -hmm. Skateboarding was my deal. Especially at a young age. So it's like to become great, you got to find it between like seven and 13 to put that time in yeah sure because you got to have that thousand hours but it's like when i when i found that skateboard my sister took me to the skate park to go visit some dude Mm -hmm. she was talking to and he was like this pro skater and i it kills me to this day but i don't know who it was Mm -hmm. or remember his name but he gave me his skateboard and they that was my introduction and the day that i got that board you know timing and alignment is everything Mm -hmm. and looking back being at that skate park taking all this in, meeting this pro skater, him giving me a board and having the opportunity to now like ride my own board in this park that Mm -hmm. I'm so enamored with, with these older guys that Mm -hmm. are doing something that looks really fun, right? Just like sobriety, appealing, Mm -hmm. like what makes me want to buy in? Mm -hmm. And at that moment, that day, I was like, dude, this is what I'm going to do until the day I die. Hmm. Like there, there was no reason for, for maybe I should go to school or get a trait or like focus on some other alternatives. Fuck that. Mm -hmm. And that's what followed me into sobriety, that mentality. Yeah, and it's like um, to be good at anything, you have to fall in love. Yeah. Because like love will take you further than discipline, will take you further than exhaustion. Like you really have to love it to really die for it. Mm -hmm. And you got like people do that with football. They fall in love with it. And then when you smoke crack, you do heroin, it's like this crazy toxic love. And yeah. Like, you know, like when I got clean, when I would listen to love songs, I would think about drugs. You know? Sure. Like that was a breakup, like this toxic relationship. And then I fell in love with recovery. And, and it went like, about it with that same attitude. Same attitude. And yeah. exactly, you know, in addiction, in skateboarding, in recovery, mm-hmm. despite any and all adverse consequences that came my way. I was going to do what I had to do to get what I wanted to get. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like in drugs, in skateboarding, in recovery, Mm -hmm. failure is not an option. The word no is unfucking acceptable Mm -hmm. because I come from that mentality, you know, that will create your reality. Mm -hmm. That simple. Yeah. And it's like we have like this uh, tool and it could be used to hurt yourself or it could be used as a superpower. And it's like. To me, recovery turned all my negatives into positives and allowed yeah. me to like double down on Straight up. whatever I wanted. Mm-hmm. I say all the time, that my medicine, my, my poison became my medicine, mm-hmm. right? And me now being sober, I am a fucking superhuman. Yeah. I'm like, I'm a superpower. I have this superpower. I'm a superhuman. Mm-hmm. Anywhere in the, the anywhere in the world, if you're diagnosed with a disease mm-hmm. and fucking you, you, the audience, the viewers, please prove me wrong. Mm-hmm. I will fucking pay you to prove me wrong (laughs) if if you're diagnosed with a disease anywhere in the world in any kind of disease you are only going to get worse not better even if you survive the disease your body's gonna have Mm -hmm. some kind of like you know reflection or takeaway from it that's not great Mm -hmm. recovery addiction alcoholism is the only disease that if you recover from it you become a better version than mm-hmm. you were even before you had it. Mm-hmm. Think of that. That's magical. 1,000%. Anything else, like you're mm-hmm. a little bit worse of a version than you were even if you fucking mm-hmm. find recovery from yeah, it. Yeah, it's like if you hear voices and you take this medication, you might not hear voices. Now nah, you're on medication that <laughs> yeah. has the side effects of yeah, like fucking of course. loss of hair, mm-hmm. limp dick, fucking All this, that. Yeah, yeah. It's like... But recovery, I mean, addiction, if Mm -hmm. you find recovery, you come back a better version than you were before you were even diagnosed with it. Mm -hmm. Dude, therefore, like when I got sober, man, and today at 45 years old, I'm in the best shape I've ever been in Mm -hmm. mentally, physically, financially, Mm -hmm. spiritually. Like I went to Barcelona and I filmed a full video part Mm. and I put it out and it's the best video part that I've ever filmed in my life Mm -hmm. in skateboarding at 45. Yeah. That doesn't fucking, that defies logic. Yeah. And it's like, I have a friend who always says like, dude, when I was using, I had dreams of being like this dope dealer with like a four wheeler and a sick ass car. And I just end up being homeless under the bridge. And then I got clean 
and I got a four wheeler and a dope ass car. Up. That's <laughs> and he's like, all my drug drug uh, fantasies and you know dreams have come true. You that's know? dude. We 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 say a lot. Mm-hmm. Of, we believe the same things. Like mm-hmm. sobriety has given me everything drugs and alcohol ever promised me. One thousand percent. You know, because I'd mm-hmm. sit. In the fucking shooting gallery, I'd sit at the pub, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd sit in the crack den, wherever I was doing whatever, and I'd be out of my mind, disconnected from reality, full with these like grandeurs of this amazing mm-hmm. life that I'm gonna have and how it's gonna be beautiful, and I'm gonna ride off into the fucking sunset of heroin. Mm-hmm. And then I'd sober up and I'm like, oh, <laughs> fuck, I wanna kill me. Mm-hmm. And then I get high, but then I get sober and I'm like, dude, I have all that. Yeah. Like, my life has never been more fulfilling and I've never felt more content with a purpose and a drive. And it's all because I've devoted my life mm-hmm. to helping others yeah. and giving away what was given to me. Mm-hmm. Again, in this magical world that we exist in called 12-step fellowships, mm-hmm. if anywhere in the business world, if I give you something that I have, I walk away with less. Mm-hmm. It's a fact. It, anywhere in this world, but in our weird recovery fucking world, if I give you something that I have, mm-hmm. whatever it is, I walk away with more. Mm-hmm. It only makes sense in our world. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of paradoxes in recovery that when you apply them in your life, it's like, why? Because as a drug addict, it's like, why would I do anything and not get something mm-hmm. out of it? You know? But as a taker your whole life, when you start giving, it's the only thing that kind of is medicine for your self selfishness. And then it starts to become like a habit. Yeah. And then you build self-esteem. Totally. And I Which was is like, what oh I God. lacked. Yeah, exactly. I, I All knew, of us. I yeah. knew I had no self-esteem. Mm-hmm. It was fucking apparent. It was evident. Mm-hmm. You told me. I told me. I felt it. And and if I knew how to get it, I would have done it on my own. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have ended up in a 12-step fellowship, right? Like, I, I, that was not my goal mm-hmm. or dream as a child. But what happened is I, I came there. I surrounded myself with really good people who genuinely mm-hmm. had my best interest at heart. They really wanted me to mm-hmm. see me in a place that I was happy with. And they started giving me these suggestions. Then they said, okay, we'll help you get a job. And they got me a job at a diner. Mm-hmm. And I'm washing dishes for six bucks an hour. And they're like, okay, you're going to show up 20 minutes early. You're going to stay 20 minutes late. You're going to wash mm-hmm. these dishes with like pride. And you're going to fucking really care about the outcome and, mm-hmm. and, and help your coworkers to the best. And, and through doing that, I was, ob- I was able to open up my very first own checking account with mm-hmm. my name on it, not with a woman who could kind of oversee shit. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm going to start paying my own 165 a week rent. I'm going to start paying bi-weekly. I'm going to start buying my own groceries, mm-hmm. buy my own cigarettes, get my own bus pass at the time when I smoked and all that. And, and, and what happened is through those esteemable acts, mm-hmm. I started to gain a sense of self-esteem. Mm-hmm. And and I started to become self sufficient, and that checking account turned into a pre secured credit card, and the pre secured <laughs> credit card turned into a credit card, and 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 all of a sudden one day, unbeknownst to me, I started to like lift my head up a little bit higher mm-hmm. and speak with conviction and and mean what I say and say what I meant, and it it all happened unbeknownst to me as anything good along my recovery journey. <laughs> and when you're in when you're using you don't realize what you're not like all the things i'm not capable of like i remember the first time someone made a plan like a month in advance whoa i was like that's heavy i remember i was like (laughs) because there was a long time i had no idea what the fuck i was going to be doing ever even early in recovery i like wasn't sure if i was really going to be clean Mm -hmm. i didn't really want to say like i would be there in two months or we're going to do something (laughs) like i I couldn't make plans you know um i cried the first time my boss gave me a check and the check from last week was still in my wallet. Ooh, that's I, heavy. I remember. Being, I relate. I had never. I've never. I've never had gotten a check and had the other check from the week together. I would. I would instantly go to Publix and just cash it. Sure. Mm-hmm. For like a ten percent fee. Like a twenty percent. Whatever. Yeah. Or fifth, sixty. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it's like, cool. Just give yeah. me the cash now. Well, that was the same with me. Like, and that's that's that was one of my my big draws mm-hmm. to recovery this time. You know, I was so disconnected from reality. Uh, and all I yearned for and ever wanted was security and stability. I wanted to know where I was going to be tomorrow and next week and next month and, and in the same bed of the same house, in the same shower. And, mm-hmm. and that's all. So like when I, you know, it's funny, I'll do interviews and they're like, well, were you were you depressed when you were in rehab? And I was like, fuck no. Mm-hmm. I was depressed 
before I got into rehab. But when I was accepted into that bed of a Catholic Charities program, <laughs> I felt like I hit the mega millions because yeah. I knew where I was going to be. Mm -hmm. I knew that I'd have this bed for 30 days. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went to a I sober really living house. I really good in treatment. Yeah, yeah. I, I've institutionalized well. I can fucking fall into line mm -hmm. and, and I can speak the rhetoric. And, mm -hmm. and But this time, what I did different is, it's funny because every one of my attempts previously, I always thought were failures because mm -hmm. I never stayed sober. And I... What I didn't know then that I see now, only because I've been able to remain sober long enough mm -hmm. to look back and recognize the synchronicity in life's events that have led me to the here and now, that proved to me God has had me the whole time. Mm -hmm. What I know is that every one of those attempts were successes because these seeds were being planted, unbeknownst to me. Mm -hmm. And when the time and the alignment was right and everything connected, uh, it was all gonna make sense. So what happened was, throughout those times they would say things like it's not the drugs or the alcohol it's the problem it's the thinking and, and I didn't know it that I knew it until later last treatment center I looked back and I'm like dude I was that boy that cried wolf a lot of times I believed it sometimes and I didn't other times um, and and I'm like you know what the common denominator in every one of my problems have been me I continue to fuck me out of a good position every time I have the ability to take advantage of one. I am the common denominator of my problems. Maybe if I just get the fuck out of my way, buy into what these people that are continuously here every time I call and ask for help are suggesting, I might stand a chance. I do that. You guys make these suggestions. I realize that, whoa, I'm my problem. If I get out of my way, I have a pretty good chance of like making it through this. And the fact of the matter is, uh, what I've always done is just talked about how great this outcome was going to be. For the first time in my life, I'm going to shut the fuck up. I stopped talking. I just walked. And while walking, surrounding myself with good people, they told me, you go here, you do this. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. I started bringing the body. I left the mind behind. Mm -hmm. I brought the body. I brought the body. The mind started to follow. My actions started to change. My narrative was shifting, mm -hmm. which was creating a better outcome. And I realized that my, my, my walk was doing my talk. I didn't have to change, I didn't have to talk to anybody about how different my life was. And all of a sudden, people started saying, hey, we'd like you to come home for Christmas dinner. Hey, we'd like you to be a part of mom's birthday party. You know, I was being invited back into the family because my behaviors were changing. All the shit they told me and mm -hmm. all those attempts that I just didn't realize were, were being embedded in me. You know, a lot of times we're just so impatient yeah. that if we would have, how come they're not inviting me over for Christmas? Well, motherfucker, if you didn't get high, they would have invited you over for New Year's. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? Or stole every Christmas present yeah. out of the house. They might want you around. Yeah, and then like we get clean. And um, w I wanted to ask this earlier because for me, it's like, dude, I get like the comments all the time. Like addiction isn't a disease. And I always tell people like next time you say that, just always preface it with, I know that nine out of ten doctors disagree with me, but I believe addiction is not a disease. But it's like. And today, it's it's in the DSM five. It's in the new DSM. It's like, it's a disease. So like, it's a it's hard for some people to like grasp the reality that it's a disease without feeling like that's a, like a a crutch. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal deal with people who are saying things like that? So here's what I do. This is kind of me as a whole, right? And you're gonna think I'm going off track with how I'm gonna start this, but it all comes back at the end. I trust you. The DEA came to me around three years ago, mm -hmm. and they said, "Look, Mr. Novak, we we recognize that we can no longer arrest our way out of the problem. Hmm. Right? The our approach is not working." Um, they said we interviewed Pablo Escobar, <laughs> and we asked Pablo, "How do we stop the supply? How do we stop the supply?" And mm -hmm. Pablo looked at them didn't blink an eye and he said, well, you stop the supply by stopping the demand, mm -hmm. right? So now the DEA comes to me and they said, we want you to be the keynote speaker for this, 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 this summit that they throw. It's called the 360 degree opioid summit. And they, they throw it in every state and the DEA just kind of puts on this big function. Mm -hmm. And they bring me out to speak to let people know that recovery is possible, that, that you don't have to die from the disease of addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and that, every drug addict isn't just a waste of time. Like there's a heartbeat behind the mm -hmm. addiction or disease. So with that being said, what I do is um, I just try to stop the demand. 
why or how by helping one person, right? Like someone helped me. Mm -hmm. And when they help me, I in turn can help another. Two help four. Four help eight. Eight help 16. Before you know it, you're changing the narrative was creating a, a, a better outcome. So I don't really get focused or caught up on who people think what or how about, right? Like that's that's not of my concern. Um, I, I really just live in my own world where knowing that the way that I believe we can fix ever having to have a conversation of is it a disease, is it a moral deficiency, mm -hmm. is simply by helping one person so they can help another so that one day this isn't even a topic of conversation anymore mm -hmm. and my treatment center's out of business, my sober living <laughs> houses are no more. Yeah. You know, that's that's my approach. Because mm -hmm. I, I debate it for a lot of years and I shot heroin for a lot of years. So, so it's pretty unrealistic for me to think that like I've been blessed with this gift of sobriety for coming up on nine years now that I, uh, the guy who was expelled from 11th grade is a direct result of my addiction, who acquired his GED in the penitentiary, mm -hmm. to now think that I have the fucking answer to this whole medical mm -hmm. world that I have no PhD in. I like that. I just stay in my lane, dog. Mm -hmm. You know, and I accept everyone for where they're at and who they are. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking more about this lately, and it's like the whole, the yin without the yang, love without hate, uh, pain without pleasure like we need the texters in the meeting because then like it allows us to not be a texter in the meeting you know what I mean like yeah. it has to offset the balance of course we need the people that are saying it's not a disease so for <laughs> people like us to be like well it is and how do I fix this disease by like 12 stepping another gentleman mm -hmm. or female so she can do the same and and then like they're no longer pairing, uh, planning their daughter's funeral anymore and me getting sober is like one less needle in your kid's playground this morning. <laughs> you know, it really is yeah. a ripple effect that goes that yeah. far. Well, there's like a real cause and effect to what I'm doing that has real world results. You know, results as opposed to battling your theory. That yeah, totally. And, and that's, you know, I, and that came, all this shit that I got mm -hmm. came from a 12-step fellowship. And, and, and my sponsor, my mentor, he said, mm -hmm. you know, get this whole fucking their part out of your brain. There is no their part. The sooner you can come to the, accept and realize that you are the problem mm -hmm. in every one of these equations, the better your life will get because you'll start living in solution mode as mm -hmm. opposed to fucking victim. So when I got clean, I thought it was so weird that grown men still had to check in with their sponsor. Mm -hmm. So when I got clean, I remember thinking like, dude, you've been clean 12, 15 years and you still got to call this guy. Mm -hmm. How can you explain like the benefit and benefits of uh, having a sponsor? Yeah. I'm, dude, I don't trust anybody that doesn't seek outside counsel or advice from someone mm -hmm. you know like if you don't see a therapist and you just you your own judge jury and executioner mm -hmm. of your own world without a relationship of some kind of spiritual entity i question you and mm -hmm. it's and it's cool everyone you know it's like where's my spirituality if i judge yours but like I know that my problem is my thinking. Left to my own devices, I will crash this thing right into the fucking ground mm -hmm. and think that it makes complete sense for me to do that because I have an alcoholic brain that will create delusional narratives mm -hmm. that lie to me in my own voice that make me believe the unbelievable. So the more that I disconnect from any form of my new reality or spirituality, I'll start believing the crazy shit that thought me into a really fucked up mm -hmm. problem at one point in time, being a 38-year-old homeless heroin <laughs> addict. So it is in it's it's a necessity that I have um, a group of people or a mentor or a sponsor or a therapist because I don't want to like dis disconnect ourselves from any viewers out there that might not be an addict or an alcoholic um, to to seek counsel advice or guidance from someone who you know is pretty well versed in that area. Yeah, you know, like to me, it's the norm. Mm -hmm. I know it's crazy. To me, it, what wasn't the norm for a long time was having a, a, a guide, a guru, a mentor. Mm -hmm. And to me, what 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 was the norm then when I didn't have positive influences in my life was um, shooting speedballs into my <laughs> neck. Was standing on the corner of Eastern Avenue in Patterson Park, letting men blow me for mm -hmm. fucking money to buy heroin. That you know, so it's like. Th yeah, that's where it ends up. So if you haven't fucking picked up on what I'm saying, get a fucking mentor or yeah. a guide. Mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> My life has gotten better since I've done that. Mm -hmm. when, the moment that I admitted complete defeat was the exact second I secured the ultimate victory. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been really trying to do a little better 
with with being broader and not just identifying drugs and alcohol because it could be food, sex, porn, shopping. Those are the solutions. Those are the results of my real problem, which is my thinking, my attitude, my behavior that mm-hmm. always takes me back to said vice. So I don't want to like alienate anybody. Yeah, yeah. You know? How did you get involved in CKY? Fuck. Uh, skateboarding. Skateboarding is... So CKY was originally a band, right? No. Yes, it was a band. Yes. But it was originally correct. a skate team? No, it was a band, but... It, it it got its attention through skateboarding. Mm-hmm. Better yet, Bam, Bam's brother Jesse, Bam Margera's brother Jesse Margera was the drummer in the band CKY. Mm. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I was a young skater out of Baltimore, and there was another professional skateboarder out of Baltimore named Bucky Lasik. Oh my God! Bucky was the guy who took me under, mentored me, got me sponsored by Pal, opened up that world, mm-hmm. going to hang out tour How with old Tony you? Hawk, stay at his house. Fucking fourteen, fifteen. What? what was Bucky and Tony like? Uh, well, Bucky was like my mentor, dude. He's like my best friend. He mm-hmm. uh, he was just. He was to me. I looked at him almost as like a fucking UFO or an <laughs> alien because he was. Although I had my first fucking beer at Bucky's house in his basement, mm-hmm. they shaved my head and we drank a fucking uh, a case of PBR, mm-hmm. at like maybe like nine, ten, and um. But I remember looking at him, and I just wanted to be like him. I wanted to emulate him. I remember mm-hmm. he had a gold chain with a B on it. I got a gold chain with a B on it. Mm-hmm. And everybody would make fun of me, mm-hmm. but like that. But I just always wanted to just like study him. Mm-hmm. I skated. I I, I I hoped like him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I had the same style as him. You know, I kind of he was just so graceful with what he did, and he saw in me, you know, a talent that I had, and he got me sponsored by Pal. So we would then in turn go from Baltimore to Pennsylvania and skate this park called Cheap Skates every weekend. That's where we met Bam. And when I saw Bam, I'm like, fuck, man, this kid's going to be a problem. Because he dressed like me, he looked like me, he skated like me. Mm -hmm. We were outside the box, contest consistent skaters, and we became thick as thieves, best Mm -hmm. friends. And uh, that's how I kind of ended up in that world of CKY with Bam and skateboarding. Mm-hmm. Then CKY, Bam's brother, was the band. Mm-hmm. Bam was like, yo, I want to make skate videos, but like skate videos that are fun, that people want to watch, that doesn't alienate non-skaters. So he's like, what's the best way to do that? Then like adding skits in between. Mm-hmm. So therefore he starts adding skits in this skate video and like people that don't skate are watching skate videos. Yeah. Fucking ingenious at the time. Oh, it's crazy to think about how wild that was because it's like i watch skate videos like i used to watch like the new york team and yeah like all this stuff back in the day and i would i wasn't even like good at skating but i like skating Rick, and I was, Harold Hunter, those yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. and i used to I'm like the music like i remember they used to have like the sickest music like i was like they would really it was just cool and you could just watch him and it was just beautiful to watch and then like when cky came out you were just like what the fuck is this but you couldn't take your eyes off it. It was ahead of its time. It was crazy. And uh, so by the time that that came out, Mm -hmm. the first CKY, Bam and I had drifted apart, right? Like I'm coming up in the skateboarding world. Mm -hmm. I'm establishing name. Bam isn't even sponsored at the time when we first met. I'm riding for Pal. He's not sponsored. He wants Bucky to try to get him sponsored by Pal. For whatever the reason is, it didn't work out. But nonetheless, every year we'd go to this contest in New Jersey called the NSA Bricktown Skate Park Contest. Mm-hmm. And either Bam would win or I'd win every year religiously. And then one year, I didn't show up to this contest. This is before CKY started. Mm-hmm. I didn't show up to the contest. And Bam goes to Bucky, where's Novak? And Bucky says, I think he's on heroin. And Bam's like, what's that? So young, he doesn't even know what the word is. Wow. Like that long ago. Needless to say, Bam's career continues to excel, fucking goes in a great direction, Mm -hmm. creates the very first CKY, which I have no part of. Mm -hmm. My career declines quickly. I pursue a life of heroin. Your IV shooting at this point? Yes. At what age? uh, I'd say by 18, full-blown, like banging. Mm -hmm. Uh, But a full-blown addict by 17. Mm -hmm. 
end of 16, 17, I've, I've acquired a dope habit. Mm -hmm. And I think that it makes more sense to do this and skate. And so then Bam creates the CKY video that makes him become a household name. Now, the way our paths cross again is at this point, I'd fucking ignore skateboarding like it was the love of my life who's now moved on with a new husband and it just <laughs> breaks my heart to see right like i don't look at it i don't want to hear it i don't want you to talk to me about it you're not even skating no no oh dude i'm like full-blown fucking junkie now mm -hmm. like in baltimore just like down and out and um when times got tough really bad days when I couldn't get money, I would go to the skate shop and fucking see if they'd take mercy on me and mm -hmm. throw me a couple bucks. But that was like really barely ever. On one particular day, I would stole all this furniture. I couldn't sell it. It was a fucking tough day. Nothing was panning out. And at the end of the day, I'm like, dude, I, I'm sick. I'll just go to the skate shop. Maybe they'll give me 10 bucks. I go into the skate shop. And they're like, Novak, we're not giving you any money. But Bam was here yesterday doing a demo with the Toy Machine team. He didn't get sponsored by Pal, but he got mm -hmm. sponsored by Toy Machine. Showed up, they did a demo, and he said, timing, alignment, right? Everything I was talking about. He said to the skate, he said, yo, you guys ever see Novak? And they're like, not really, mm. but sometimes they'll show up asking for money. And he said, mind you, he was here just the day before. He said, if, if he shows up, give him my number and tell him if he wants to get clean to call me. That was Bam? It. Yeah, that was the... That's he, so crazy to see. The oh alignment and timing, which I couldn't recognize then that I mm -hmm. see now, right? Like, it's all timing and alignment. Mm -hmm. And I take that number, and uh, and I go to the payphone up the street, and I put 50 cents in. It's during that mm -hmm. era. And it's 50 cents is all, like, I have, and I'm, like, <laughs> holding the receiver because, like, God forbid I get a machine, mm -hmm. I lose 50 cents. And, and I call... And uh, it's a skate shop. He wouldn't give me his real number. Mm -hmm. It's a skate shop. And they're like, yo, Novak. And I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for Bam. I'm like, well, he actually was just here. He's right next door at the sushi shop yeah. at Kuma having mm -hmm. sushi. We'll go grab him. Because I couldn't have called. I didn't have money. You couldn't call back. Yeah. No phone. Yeah. So they put him on hold and they go over and they get him. Mm -hmm. A timing again. And he comes back and he's, he's like, and we picked up right where he left off. And later that night, I was on a Greyhound bus from Baltimore to Westchester. And when I got there, he's like, dude, if you want, you can live here forever. And he took me to the skate shop and he got me clothes. What? He got me set up. And, and that was one of the fucked up things is that despite knowing I had the opportunity and now CKYs, and then I'm in the CKYs. Did which, you clean up? No. Well, that's the thing. So then I get in the CKYs. You hide it? I'm trying my best. I end up in the Viva La Bams, which then I end up in the jackasses. Mm -hmm. But throughout that time, them not understanding addiction I was not allowed to do downers, no opiates. I could do coke and I could drink because it's socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. I don't steal your shit. I don't rob your fucking house. I don't nod out and fucking mm -hmm. die in your bathroom. So you're not doing opiates? No, I'm, I'm not allowed. It's, okay. it's very well known. Bam kind of tells everyone. But I can do blow and drink. <laughs> so as an addict, you know what I mean? Like, I know that like as soon as I get a chance, I'm going to do what I really want. Mm -hmm. This is just buying. So ultimately... And, and it's it, like slowing down when the cops next to you. Yeah, 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 totally. Knowing that like <laughs> the jig's up at some point. Yeah. And that's the thing. And I mm -hmm. really, it's hard to unpack this in this short period of time. And this is a, a selfless plug, I guess. But my new book, The Streets of Baltimore, I really dive into the psychology of mm -hmm. an addict, knowing that like I'm being afforded this opportunity to become a household name. I'm mm -hmm. writing books. I'm getting paid by fucking Paramount, Viacom, whatever. And, and I know it's only a matter of time before my addiction fucking destroys it all. And mm -hmm. I know that it's coming. So it's just this inner fucking battle that I was always fighting. Knowing Again, going back to the beginning, security and stability is all I ever wanted. And I knew that it could happen at any moment. Bam could walk in, and which had happened a mm -hmm. lot. And it, he could have found a needle in, in, in a fucking stash spot that I hid outside or he could have ran into someone in town that sold me some pills or some heroin and I'm kicked out right back to Baltimore which mm -hmm. is now where I'm homeless again eating out of trash you know what I mean so there were a lot of peaks and valleys a lot mm -hmm. of really high highs and like low fucking lows what was being on Viva La Bam like well, it was amazing. It was fucking fun. It was great. It was one of the best times of my life. I'd go back and do it all over again. But it was also a junkie's dream, hmm. right? I had this fucking addiction that is totally running my whole world, um, that that's all I think about. 
I have this opportunity to be on like Viva La Bam mm -hmm. and Jackass. And the character that I play is really my true addicted self. Mm -hmm. The more outrageous my behaviors are, the, the more, more outlandish my antics become, the higher the ratings go, the more in demand I become, the more money I make, mm -hmm. more drugs I can buy. Wash, rinse, repeat. Mm -hmm. And I am fucking applauded for the crazy shit that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting rewarded. And now I'm doing appearances in nightclubs. And they're like, yo, what do you want in your green room on your mm -hmm. rider? And I like some hair. No, well, I wouldn't say hair. I'm like some cocaine, some Xanax, mm -hmm. some wine. And they give me that shit. And then I take uh, pictures. I'd sign autographs. And I get a check for like five grand. Mm -hmm. no, so no. I'm now being paid. to. So that's to why. <laughs> yeah. That's why it really was tough for me to get sober because it was my identity mm -hmm. i assumed it i used it to enable my behaviors and justify mm -hmm. my alcoholism and minimize the severity of it so i read um it's so interesting that it's like 12-step program has been viewed as like hocus pocus to a lot of people like praying in group circles and shit mm -hmm. but uh i read atomic habits and um it's so interesting that the way that he describes changing a habit is verbatim the 12-step program mm -hmm. it he is. says like change how you identify yourself which we're calling each other recovering addicts instead of just junkies and crackheads yeah get around a group of people that believe in you <laughs> and support you change what you're trying to do instead of not trying to eat pizza try to eat salad so instead of not shooting Make drugs a conscious effort chair the meeting better. do service change the behaviors yeah it's crazy and it's like dude i read that whole book and I'm like, this is why 12 steps. I didn't even like, need to do that. Yeah, I, I do this. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't like the book because I was like, this is all the stuff the program taught me. Totally. Yeah. That, it's, 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 it's so profound. Mm -hmm. And it's so fucking, it, it works. Mm -hmm. It's tried, it's proven successful. Yet I overlook it. Mm -hmm. And this is why. You, myself, anyone in recovery, and this is one blanket statement that I stand by and I can stake for everybody in recovery and addicts. Mm -hmm. We don't end up in that position because we took the short bus to school, <laughs> right? We get there because we're too smart for our own fucking good. And then I land into a program, a treatment center, a 12-step meeting, a psychiatrist's office, a doctor's office, a, a place that literally has the ability to save my life and I outthink myself right out of it. Paired with the fact that recovery is one of those things that works so fucking well, I stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Right? I can go somewhere when the pain becomes great enough. I'll pick up that phone. I'll say, please help me. Please help mm -hmm. me. I end up in your treatment center. I'm there for 30 days. I get everything <laughs> back that I want that caused me to go in the first place mm -hmm. because it was taken away from me. And then I'm like, ah, now the things I did in order to get those things back that mm -hmm. were the motivating factor for me to even reach out for help in the beginning, go to meetings, get mm -hmm. a sponsor, work the steps, help other alcoholics, now become an inconvenience because my schedule's full. Mm -hmm. It's such a fucking mind Th fuck. This is why the 12-step work is so important because what most people do is they get clean, they do some of the work, the pain gets alleviated, then the pain goes away and then it's filled with pleasure. Then there's no reason to do the work to make the pain go away because it's not there. And then there's no reason to do it anymore unless you have a commitment to help others that keeps you going Engage because it's no longer about you not feeling feeling better. It's about you getting other people to feel better. And then it keeps you in the cycle. And before you know, it, you've been clean for 15, 20 years. But if it was just about you, and once you don't even realize it. Yeah, you don't even know what it's working. Your sponsor just said, here, go help the newcomer. But it's totally. like, if it was just about me, once I started feeling better, I would stop doing the things that made me feel better because I feel better now. And I, uh, after step three, should not be motivated by pain anymore. Yeah, so, for sure. Couldn't agree more. Pain, may, pain motivating you needs to change to be motivated by helping others mm -hmm. and like the good things. But pain goes away, so it can't be a long-term thing. But this is the fucked up thing about addiction. And I, I didn't understand any of this <laughs> until I understood it. And looking back, I'm, I'm a smart guy, right? My mother's a nuclear physicist. My brother's, who's on the board of Mercy Hospital. My brother's an attorney in the White House who practices pensions and benefits. My father dies a direct result of addiction, right? He taught me one thing in life, if and when I go to prison, how to conduct myself. <laughs> never had a job a day in his life. Ran He's with like, the hell's don't angels. Ever, don't ever tuck someone's food. Yeah, yeah, you always have cigarettes. Make sure, <laughs> make sure your conversation's full. He was around just enough to let me know he wasn't around, kind of deal. So I knew right from wrong, mm -hmm. right? And, and I, as an addict, an alcoholic, 
too smart for my own fucking good. Mm -hmm. If I believe it, I can see it, not the other way around. And I'm like, I couldn't understand how I'd get beat to a fucking bloody pulp. Every time I stepped in the ring with my addiction, mm. I'm a smart guy. Like I can see and uh, recognize danger and like fucking divert from that. Like, and I'm talking not like, you know, a fat lip or a skinned up knee. Mm -hmm. I'm talking like teeth pulled out with pliers, fucking skinned alive, ears cut off, mm -hmm. eyes gouged out, fucking dick ripped off, <laughs> asshole fucking with a plunger. <laughs> like I'm talking that beating every time. And I'm like, dude, how does this happen so bad every time? And I didn't know then that I know now, and that's one of the reasons why I'm sober. Mm -hmm. Main reason is because I always underestimated the opponent that I was up against because I possessed that job that consisted of knowing everything. I never gave my addiction or my alcoholism the time, attention, and respect it fucking deserved. Mm -hmm. Hence, of course, it saw me coming a mile away and was like, ah, here comes this bitch again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't wait to fucking rape him every mm -hmm. which way but Sunday. And when I when I got beaten to a bloody pulp, mm -hmm. right, demoralized in just such a fashion from drugs and alcohol that I was left in the worst place that I could have ever imagined with myself, by myself, forced to focus on myself alone. Fuck, that, that's why I got high, to escape from this reality. But the addict that I was, people had to love me from a distance. Because if you told me you love me, that equated to 10 bucks. And then I'd apologize for stealing it from you and it'd be a wash, rinse, repeat. But once I got to a point where people were like, dude, it's best for everyone to stay the fuck away. Mm -hmm. Then I, I couldn't like distract myself i couldn't justify or minimize the severity of my situation anymore and i'm like dude i gotta figure out what the fuck is like going on that's allowing me to continue to do this so i started like just fucking work i started to work i started to get into the thick of it my sponsor used to say the same thing he would be like bro you get in the ring with mike tyson and he fucking beats your ass you got no teeth you're mm -hmm. fucking coming in in a wheelchair then you got an oxygen tank and you still want to fight mike tyson and then you have a guy like me who's like hey man i'll train you for your next fight you're like no nah, i got it i'm good <laughs> I, and here's the hit here's the hit i hate to break it to everyone out there listening mm -hmm. we're fighting a fixed fight Mm -hmm. We are fighting a fixed fight. The only way to win is, is to, to feel lose. like I don't want to fight. Yeah, to, yeah. yeah. It's which it's is the opposite of the way we think prior yeah. to coming into recovery. Yeah. Because when I am out there getting high, to fight is to win. To mm -hmm. fight is to survive. To fight is to get one more blast. I come in here, to fight is to lose. To fight is to die. To fight is to relapse. Surrender to win. It's such a mind fuck, right? You diagnose, okay, here's a fact. Factual evidence. And if you're listening... Acquire this information and knowledge that we're giving you and you will stand a chance against your opponent. I did and this is what I did. And if it makes sense to you and there's more similarities than differences, then you might want to listen. If not, <laughs> by all means, I'll salute you wherever you go. <laughs> I'll fucking, I'm all about it. But here's what I'm up against. If we've been diagnosed with the disease of addiction or alcoholism and you accept that diagnosis, mm -hmm. all that means, and this is facts. Don't waste my time talking about it later. This is a fact. Look it up anywhere. If we've been diagnosed with a disease of addiction or alcoholism, and you agree with the diagnosis, all that means is we've been diagnosed with a disease that equals death. It's fatal. Absolute fact. It's mm -hmm. a fatal disease if left untreated. That's a fact. But here's the scary part. That's not even scary. That's like the fucking foreplay. This is the scary part. It's the only fatal disease that I possess that lies to me in my own voice telling me I no longer have this disease because mm -hmm. I've remained abstinent for 30 days and my life's gotten better. Mm -hmm. And it lies to me in my own voice and mm -hmm. it makes me believe the unbelievable. It's not like your voice appears in my head and it's like, ah, Novak, you're no longer an addict. Mm -hmm. And I can be like, fuck you, stranger danger. Mm -hmm. My voice in my head, follow me. I'm gonna bring it home right here. Diagnose me with HIV. I'm going to the hospital to get medication. I don't wanna die, fatal disease. Mm -hmm. Diagnose me with cancer. I'm going to the hospital to get chemo. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. Diagnose me as an addict or an alcoholic. I need a glass of wine or a bag of heroin to figure out what the fuck's wrong with you for diagnosing me with said disease. <laughs> it's just as fatal as the first two diseases. But left to my own devices, I will leave this fucking chair. I will get in my car, go to TD Bank, pull out an undisclosed <laughs> amount of cash because I haven't gotten high, which means I've been mm -hmm. able to save a lot of money. I'll drive right around the way and buy as much dope and coke as I can shoot in my arm. Mm -hmm. And I can make those decisions make complete sense to me right now. Mm -hmm. 
as long as I'm only attending Brandon's Anonymous, <laughs> as long as Brandon's sponsoring Brandon, and Brandon becomes Brandon's God, it's not a matter of if, but when mm -hmm. my history repeats itself, which it usually does. And there's things in recovery that teach you to not put yourself in situations. So I used to think that willpower was like, I just didn't have strong enough willpower. But it's like, you know, if you're married and you're trying not to, you don't want to cheat on your wife, you probably shouldn't go on a business trip with a woman you're kind of sexually attracted to. And, it may, and maybe you do, but maybe you should get separate hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you shouldn't sleep in the same, like, it's like eventually, like, you're just doing something that is kind of dumb. No matter how strong your commitment to your wife is, there's situations that no one should really put themselves into. And I was the type that I would get clean and then I go hang on my friends who smoke crack, act like I wasn't going to yeah. smoke crack. Yeah, yeah. And I would put myself in the car and I would be like, how did I end up in a car with everyone going to go, go do drugs as if it like magically happened? But I knew they were doing drugs. I knew we were hanging out. I knew that they could get a phone call to say they're going to go cop. And then I would get stuck in the car with them. And then even though I didn't want to do drugs, I'd end up, throwing down or something for sure it's so, always saying you know you, you keep going to the barber shop you're gonna get a haircut, haircut. Mm -hmm. you know and i agree with that and again early on my sponsor said look always stay arm lengths away from a drink right now i've i've had a spiritual experience as a direct result of the 12 steps the definition of a spiritual experience is simply a psychic change. So I, Brandon Novak, today no longer look at things the way I did when I was 30, 60, 90, one month, two month, five years into sobriety, right? I'm, the, the desire has been lifted. The obsession has been removed. I am a free fucking man. Mm -hmm. I went to Amsterdam to an AA meeting and got my <laughs> four-year medallion. Wow, that's sick. Most people don't equate Amsterdam and recovery, mm -hmm. but I, I can do Go that. Go anywhere. Because, because... I know that I suffer with that a disease mm -hmm. called alcoholism, not alcoholism, <laughs> right? And I can't stay sober on mm -hmm. yesterday's sobriety. So I remain proactive in my recovery, mm -hmm. right? They told me early on in the beginning, if you stick to the basics, kid, you'll never have to go mm -hmm. back to the basics. So I legit live my life through those cliche fucking bullshit mm -hmm. things that people are so sick of hearing. And it sounds crazy with addiction because it's so extreme. But people do this every fucking day with other shit. You know how many people I know who are lactose intolerant, who fucking eat fucking cheese and go shit themselves I'm like why the fuck did i eat cheese and a month later they're like well let me just have a little bit and then they fucking shit themselves again yeah. it's like why the fuck did i do that and it's like people do this with drinking i'm never gonna drink again people do this with diets you know people are gonna sign up to the gym january 1st and then fucking not go same. fucking well, january same, 2nd. With, same with aa meetings mm -hmm. january 1st you see it's fucking Everyone's flooded in, yeah. treatment centers january 1st fucking mm -hmm. flooded you know like th these new years but it's not the gym's fault no you know no i'm and again i i'm a big fan of um pain right when the pain was my motivating factor that was the only thing that ever dictated any form of change i don't change when shit's unmanageable yeah, unmanageable to me is a monday morning cup of tea that's what the fuck i do i only change when shit becomes unbearable unbearable backs against the wall no other options mm -hmm. pain unbearable but i have to act quick that window of opportunity for change mm -hmm. is generally the same size as a ten dollar bill mm -hmm. right pain's unbearable willing to do anything to get myself out of this terrible position that i can't take i get 10 bucks buy a bag of dope put it in my arm all of a sudden i believe this was just an overreaction at mm -hmm. best you just called me at a bad time in a yeah. bad way on a bad day mm -hmm. tomorrow's gonna be different mm -hmm. tomorrow will be different and mm -hmm. i believe it Right, because I have this disease that lies to me in my own voice, makes me believe that I'm believable. Tomorrow's gonna be different, mm -hmm. and I believe it. I'll pass a polygraph, flying colors. But then I wake up tomorrow, and, and I, I repeat yesterday's actions, and I'm stuck in Groundhog's Day for like 20 yeah. fucking years. What was it like being with Jackass and Steve-O and Knoxville and all those guys? It was fucking. It was amazing. It was it was the best ever. You know, it it was funny because, again, looking at my timeline when Bam had brought me into all of that. Prior to that, I was like a homeless fucking heroin addict mm -hmm. living in shooting galleries in West Baltimore, like doing ungodly things to come up with money and mm -hmm. shit. Um, and now I'm like in these movies that break box office <laughs> records. I'm the guy that will do any stunt in the world. They're like, you're insane. I'm like, no, I'm a fucking drug addict. Mm -hmm. And here's the hit, right? If I do a stunt and I get hurt, a, the worse the stunt goes, the more press it will mm -hmm. get, uh, the more in demand, more money I make, mm -hmm. more drugs I can buy. But then I'm carted off to the hospital, right? I'm not allowed to do uh, downers. Mm -hmm. I can only do blow and alcohol. You can do them in there. But if I go to the hospital and I break both ankles and I have a script of mm -hmm. 30s, 
I'm allowed and it's fucking welcome. Mm-hmm. And I actually get high, high fives, fives for the mm-hmm. awesome fucking skit that I just did that's going to get Jackass that much more promotion. Mm. Dude, it's a, it's all the way I, mm-hmm. I was that guy, dude. What um, what was like your favorite thing that you did? Anyone that got me screen time yeah. because Damn it man. got me more money, that mm-hmm. got me more drugs, that made me like be able to enable my addiction a little bit more. Did Steve O get clean before you? Fuck yeah. yeah. I remember being on uh, Jackass 2 set. And uh, his sponsor was there. He what was, was like, it like really seeing sober. him get sober? And it clean. was weird because we had partied were you, together. Were you like angry? Because no, you're never okay. angry, mm-hmm. dude. I was a I was a fucking intelligent guy. Like I knew that my life was gonna turn out one of two ways: either I was gonna get sober or I was gonna die in the pursuit of it. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I was never that guy. It's like I'm just gonna be a junkie till the day I die. You were trying. Like I remember we'd be filming Viva La Bam. And we'd finish, we'd rap for the day. Mm-hmm. And we'd all, the cast, the crew, we'd go into town to a bar, and there'd be a table of 30, 50. And uh, and before we would go there to get loaded, right? Mm-hmm. We'd drink, we'd fucking whatever, blow. But before I would go meet them, I would go to an AA meeting. Hmm. And Bam's like, why the fuck do you go to these meetings and then meet us right after to get <laughs> fucked up? Yeah. And he didn't get it, and I didn't either, to be truthful, quite frank. But I just knew that that day, one of those days were going to come. I die or I get sober. So like when, when did I'd you see believe Steve-O that the program it, worked? Like, did you, you uh, believed in the program if you're going? So like, when did you like even good question. find an interest where you're like, maybe this isn't like a hoax? You know, you know, you know what? A, I liked the the camaraderie because there were like minded people there. Despite like Bam being my best friend mm-hmm. and in this jackass world, they didn't really think like I thought. They didn't look at things the way I saw them, but you fucking weirdos did. So, and you could relate and you knew what it was like to use against your will, despite how great the payoff was going to mm-hmm. be if you didn't. So, so that kept me going. And then the one thing that I always loved, <laughs> it's funny. I never thought about this. I'm not a traditions guy. Mm-hmm. And people say I probably break a lot of the traditions because I'm pretty open and vocal about what saved my life. But that third tradition is what kept me coming back. The only desire, the only membership, the only desire, the only requirement Remember for membership, membership is, is a desire to stop to using. Stop using. Mm-hmm. And that was me. That's all that they asked out of me. Mm-hmm. Because I would, I was that guy that would go to meetings. Hi. I was that guy that would go to the meetings and overdose in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. I was the guy that would go to meetings just because it was the only time my now ex fiance would allow me out of the house <laughs> without fucking watching me in every move I made to mm-hmm. where I could score my dope at the meetings. So, but you guys always let me come back. And I really respected that security and stability. You guys provided that for me, even though I wasn't providing it for me. You said that this is always a safe place that I was welcome. And I felt welcomed when I went, even when I was nodding out, even when the emergency crew had to come in and like pull me out of the bathroom because I had a needle in my arm, overdosed. Mm -hmm. You never told me I couldn't come back. And that, that, that was very appealing to me. I knew that it worked but I didn't understand why it didn't work for me, hmm. right? Like I knew that it worked because I had really good friends who attempted to sponsor me and, and they were like really rad guys that liked the same kind of music I liked and skated and used like I used. But I just couldn't understand why it wasn't working for me. But I knew that it worked. How much of it was lack of effort? For all of it. <laughs> All of it. I run groups, dude. And I, I'm like, look, you, you try to fast track this. You only fuck yourself. Mm-hmm. And here's the deal. Procrastination is like masturbation. You only fuck mm-hmm. yourself. Right? Like you can fast track this, but I'm going to be here doing what I do. I, you can't like you can't. You have to give it the attention and respect it deserves. I'm not, yeah. I know this one guy who used to say, you walk a thousand miles in the woods, it's going to take a thousand miles to get out. Straight up. And it's, I would have three months clean and be like, why don't I feel better? Why da, da, da? These people don't trust me. Mm-hmm. What was, uh, okay, so what was Steve-O like when you saw him get sober? Well, he was just, he he was probably not that much. He was different because he was insane as a drug addict. He was fucking insane. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, he was very different sober but it was probably stranger for me because I didn't know how to talk to him because the things that we did mm-hmm. before all revolved around drugs and alcohol. Mm-hmm. So now he's on set filming Jackass 2 and there's this weird guy that I thought was weird, just a regular guy, but just wasn't one of us, like by his side the whole time. Mm-hmm. And he only really spent a lot of time with this guy mm-hmm. and he listened to this guy and 
and I, things were changing, but I didn't know to what extent. And and you know we're fucking filming Jackass, <laughs> so like it's a party. So mm-hmm. I wasn't really too concerned with what he was. I just knew going something on. was different, but I was like, dude, let's fucking go. What was it like? What who reached out to you the most during your active addiction? Well, like who, who it just do you depends at times when because yeah. like it would be you know peaks and valleys like people would attempt people would try and people would give it their all and then they would get frustrated and they'd be like fuck it let them mm-hmm. figure it out ebbs and flows but they all like the one thing that all those guys did that was good is they never like which i don't now i don't chase people down for mm-hmm. recovery or sobriety like I, I don't i refuse to like chase people and they did but pretty quickly they're like dude he's got to want it mm-hmm. and then i'd go back to baltimore I, I would always i could always get a bed in like a halfway house because mm-hmm. you just pay a couple bucks and hopefully pass a piss test and so i'd be there and i'm like dude i remember being in this shitty ass recovery house and i look up and it's the vma's and it's fucking Bam presenting Eminem his award. Hmm. And I'm in this like shitty, like really bottom of the barrel recovery house. And I don't belong here. And and that was so humiliating. Seeing my best friend mm-hmm. present an award to Eminem where I clearly could have been a part of all of that. But again, my addiction... Uh, I allowed my addiction to rob me of another beautiful experience. That sucked. Would it be like annoying going to meetings or treatment centers or halfways and people just being like, you're the guy from da 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 da? It was, it, it's, I'm glad you asked that. It, I, usually it never bothered me, mm-hmm. right? And, and when I would end up in those places, it was cool because it would allow me to like make friends fairly easy. But at the end, so I go to this 90 day inpatient treatment center. And then from there, I'm accepted to this other state-ran facility that's free. Um, I think they might have took your Medicaid, but I think it was free. But the the goal of this place, it was a six-month program, and they'd help you get a job, and you were to save every dollar you made That so when you left, you had like a Money. foundation. Mm-hmm. And, and they fed you, they clothed you, they housed you. And now I had been in treatment for 90 days. I'm taking this thing serious. I have a sponsor. I'm in step work. Mm-hmm. And at this place, when I got there, everyone wanted to ask me about that. What's this person like? Was that real? Did this hurt? Was that fun? And I, I, didn't, I didn't have time for that. Like, I was on a whole new tip, right? The, the, the stakes were too high. I wasn't there to talk about it. I wasn't angry at them for asking me, but I, that wasn't the page I was on. So what I did was, instead, I smoked cigarettes at the time. Um, I stopped smoking outside and I started smoking in my bedroom and they fucking came up and they caught me and they kicked me out of the place. Now I'm 90 days. This happened the first two weeks I was there. So I'm like 90, like a hundred days sober. Mm -hmm. And yet again, I'm kicked out of a program. Are you like, cause I've seen this happen a lot of time. Are you the client who's like, fuck, this is bullshit. Why am I getting kicked out for such a petty thing? Or are you like, I get it. This before. Yes. This time totally accepted my fate. Like I knew, right. I started to become, become accountable for my actions. I looked at the part that I played, right. It's a rule. My behaviors were changing, right. Mm -hmm. My behaviors were changing. I was understanding of like what I, what part I played. I'm getting involved in step work, Mm -hmm. starting to build up a defense against like returning back to drugs and alcohol. And, uh, and they're like, you're going to have to leave. And now all my clothes are still in trash bags, right? So now yet again, 100 days sober, it looks like I'm doing the same old thing. I'm standing in front of a place with my trash bags. I call my mother. I'm like, I was, I was kicked out. They are terrified that I'm doing the same old thing that I had always done, rightfully so. And I called my sponsor, and he said, uh, he said did you use I said, no. He said, okay, we're going to help you find a place. And, and he helped me find a sober living house that was amazing. And it was weird because it wasn't amazing by way of like what most people think <laughs> amazing would be. This house was literally you just paid rent and stay sober. Now, that would be terrible for someone else. Mm-hmm. There was no accountability. There was no house manager. There was no piss test. But again, timing and alignment, and, and it was perfect for me at that time. Other mm-hmm. times, it would have been the death of me, yeah. right? But I was on the tip of like taking this serious. And he said, the only thing that has to change in this move is your address, not your clean date. And I went from that, that place to this sober living house. 
and and I I just kept it moving, right? And I learned from my mistake, and I'm like, dude, I I, I despite that my intentions were good behind smoking in that bedroom, like that was not right, mm-hmm. you know. So when I was using, um, I remember I was like day three of being dope sick, like half shitting myself, and I like come up with a scheme to rob this lady. And um, we go to this trailer park, and my friend's in a pickup truck, and he's like, what are you going to do? And I remember being like, dude, this lady has pills. Like, I'm just going to grab them from her. Yeah. And I remember my friends were like, okay. I'm like, wait down the street. And I remember, dude, I'm so dope sick. And I, like, walk up to this lady, and she's like, where's the money? I'm like, let me see the pills. She's like, where's the money? And I was like, let me see the pills. And I'm just like, you know. Back and forth. You know, I'm just like, let me see the pills. And she's like, they're right here, and they're, like, in this little bag, and, like, a cellophane bag. It's, like, seven pills. And, um. I was like, let me make sure they're the A two one threes instead of like the yeah. ETHs, and she sh- shows them to my face, and I grab them and I push her, and I start running down the street, and I jump in the bed of the truck, and I remember I put them to my chest, and I was just smiling, and I was just like, man, if I have this, like the whole world, everything's could, dude, right. The whole world could fall. It could be Armageddon. All is right. With Aliens the world. could come invade. My parents could die. Like if I had yeah. this, nothing else matters. And when I got clean, I made that my clean time. So when wow. I got clean, I was yeah. like, man, if I just have my clean time, totally, I don't care what happens. If I don't use, I just hold my clean time to my chest. Yeah. No one's ever going to take it from me. It's going to keep building and building and building. And prior to that, I would be like, well, if you don't do X, Y, and Z and you don't believe me, or you don't, I'll give up my clean time. I got expectations. All the time. Right? And then we get into the work, mm-hmm. right? I'm a big fan of expect. Well, I was. Expectations mm-hmm. were everything, right? And it says in the book that expectations are nothing but unfulfilled resentments. And resentments in the book are alcoholics' number one offenders. It will take us back to drink. Not maybe, possibly. It will. It's the number one offender, mm-hmm. right? Because no person, place, or thing is ever going to live up to my standards, mm-hmm. including myself. You will let me down. <laughs> it's not a matter of if, but when. So once I learn that, I'm like, okay, I can't control your action, but I can control my reaction to your action. And all I can control in this world is my thinking, my attitude, my behavior. It made my world easier to navigate through because I stopped placing. If if they do this, I'm doing this. Because mm-hmm. and that oh, it was just me kind of like projecting on mm-hmm. you a specific outcome for me to justify my relapse behaviors. Mm-hmm. As long as they're headed me in the direction of a a handful of pills. Yeah. What um? So we were talking. So when did you write your first book? Well, I wrote my first book, Dream Seller, by way of um an ultimatum. No high school diploma, GED in prison later, Mm -hmm. but I'm living with Bam. We're doing Viva La Bam. And he was always really like uh, enamored and fascinated by those kind of stories, right? The the stories uh, and things I did while in active addiction. Mm-hmm. Like you just told with the pills, but you know, so I tell these stories, we go to those dinners and, and I he'd be like, you got to make a book. I tell these stories and you could hear a pin drop at a table of 50 people mm-hmm. were just like, so he's like, yes, he's like, all right. Cause before the rule was I can live at BAMS. I can be on Viva La Bam. I can have a car. I can have a credit card. I can get paid for the show, but I can't do pills or heroin of any sort. Mm-hmm. Now it was like, I can do all those things. Stay away from the pills, heroin. Mm-hmm. But I, I have to write a book. Wow. I have to write a book. I, I ha- and he gives me a, mm-hmm. a notebook and a pen. He said, you are to carry this with you 24-7. He wow. said, I don't give a fuck if you're not writing. The first time I don't see you with that in your hand, you're going back to Baltimore. Wow. So now I'm living in it. Literally, it's like it's a castle. The Viva La Bam show, it's like a castle, like legit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's this big, humongous house. It's built like a castle. Uh, I'm like fucking the best my life has ever been now like god damn it i gotta write a fucking book like (laughs) i don't fucking know how to write a book i Mm -hmm. school i could give a fuck less about writing a book Mm -hmm. the team captain for element at this point in time a guy by the name of kingman he was at the house and he handed me a book one day and that book was a million little pieces by james frey whoa i fell in love with the book right me too i fell in love with the book now i have the book now bam saint alignment and synchronicity mm-hmm. time and crazy i'm just putting this together 
He said, you're going to write this book. I love the the million little pieces. Mm -hmm. So I open up a million little pieces and I look it's at written, the outline. It's so crazy. The way that it's written, there's no like commas. Dude, so I, I look at the outline. Mm -hmm. His book is written in 12 chapters. I write mine in 12 chapters. Bam tasks this other guy who's a filmer, who's also a professor. He filmed, he, Joe Franz, he filmed all the CKY videos. Mm -hmm. He's the one that created CKYs that then went on to film Viva La Bam. He, jackass, he works for the Discovery Channel, but he's my co-author. Mm -hmm. He takes my 12 chapters, he turns them into 23 chapters. Bam's manager gets us a literary agent. That literary agent shops our manuscript around. A whole lot of no's, a couple yeses. We come to an agreement with Kensington Publishers, Citadel Press. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how that book was born. That was never my, again, anything good in my life has happened unbeknownst to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not nearly clever enough to create this outcome mm -hmm. for what you see me in. Fuck no. <laughs> That's not, you know, mm -hmm. I'm too smart for my own good. I'll think myself out of a good opportunity. I have to be, like, it has to be, like, told to me in some way, mm -hmm. shape, or form where I have to buy into it. Mm -hmm. Had to buy in the book because I didn't want to lose the ability to be on a TV show mm -hmm. or live in a mansion. No thought of it being a real book. In no, I just like, whatever, dude, let's do it. And band. then I write the book, and the book does fucking crazy good. It's recently... Did you make a lot of money off it? No. Fucking none. None. <laughs> and it, it, this book, Dream Seller, was recently revised in its 12th edition. Mm. That meant nothing to me until mm -hmm. I was in the literary world. And they told me 98% of books that are published don't get revised after the first edition, meaning they don't have to print more copies. Mm. This thing has been revised 12 different times, mm. three different covers, uh, additional chapters added, new ending added. And... Um, it became like uh, I, it, it's it's fucking insane how well this book did. Mm -hmm. But the day the book was being released in Times Square in New York City, was it written as like overcoming addiction? No, no, it was just, <laughs> just like it was just written story. of my story. And uh -huh. here's how it was written. And I'm gonna send you the book. Uh, but if anyone out there is interested, I just did the narrations for that one, mm -hmm. and then the Streets of Baltimore, which is the sequel to that mm -hmm. one. So I actually did the narration, so it's me and my voice reading the book. So if anyone wants to buy it, you can get it on any major platform sold. But um, I I wrote the book, and how it starts is, you'll understand more so than most, A Million Little Pieces starts out with him on that plane, flying in, teeth knocked out, fucking like coming to the mm -hmm. store. This is like, what are you doing? My first, that book starts with me doing something I swore I would never do, which was let a man blow me for heroin wow. on this corner after trying to fucking pawn the shit that I stole mm -hmm. all day. It's 11 o'clock at night. I'm confronted with an uh, opportunity. Of, and, and I used to skate on the, like past these boys on this corner and make fun of them because we, as a young skater, and all of a sudden, I'm now them. And this night, this fucking guy in a Cadillac beeps his horn. He's like, what are you doing with the stuff? And I'm like, selling it. And he's like, I don't want to buy it, but I have 100 bucks. And I know oh what he means. God. And it's like 1030 at night. I swore I would never do this. Like, mm -hmm. I'd make fun of these boys. Mm -hmm. Life right-sizing me, right? Humility at its finest mm -hmm. right here. And this is how my book starts. Very similar. I had to come out yeah. with a heavy hitter. You have to get my attention or else I'm mm -hmm. bored. And uh, the guy... I get in the guy's car. We drive now in Baltimore. The dope shops don't usually stay open past 11 p.m. Right? Really? 11 p.m. They're kind of wow. then like weird shady people come out and they burn and you. Yeah. And they'll burn. It's just yeah. a questionable market. After, So it's like 10 fucking 30, 10 48. I break the time mm -hmm. down the book and, and the guy gets me in the car. We go. He blows me. I'm not a gay guy. I'm like, dude, am I going to be able to come? Is this like, and I'm on a tight timeline. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get the money. What if I get there and the guys are, ah, all these things in my mind. Mm -hmm. We finish the act. He drops me off. I go there. I fucking, it's like 11.03. The block's changed. I'm sick. I'm ill. I've been up since 4.30 in the morning if trying to come up with I'm money. Fuck no. I buy three bags of dope. A nickel, oh I buy three bags of dope, a nickel of coke. I get them. I'm sick. I'm antsy. I'm mm -hmm. fucking quick. I'm impulsively making decisions that I normally wouldn't have done because I'm so ill. I've been up since 4.30 in the morning trying to get out the gate, get right, not feel sick. I get to the little bodega 
right? Uh, this is then when cigarettes were five bucks. Mm -hmm. I got 40 bucks, right? So I buy three bags of dope for $10, uh, a and nickel coke. coke for five, and I have $5 to buy cigarettes. He only gave me 40 bucks out of the whole transaction, not 100. And, uh, and I'm in line, I'm waiting to get the cigarettes, and I'm like, all right, and I'm like, let me taste this. And I put the little bit of dope, I put it to my tongue, it's fucking drywall. I put the next one, drywall. I'm fucking consumed by panic. I'm like, let me taste the Coke. Not that Coke's going to do anything because I'm fucking dope, dope sick. sick. The Coke's fucking fake. No. I, I Right before, as the lady's about to hand me the $5 for uh, the cigarettes, I'm about to give her the $5, I yank the five bucks back, go down the street and buy these little $3 janky pills of dope. It's not like it is today where I hear that dope Fentanyl. or fentanyl's three dollars a thing or five dollars. Mm -hmm. I buy this three dollar pill that like doesn't and and that was the beginning. So then I end up in rehab where I meet my therapist, this mm -hmm. guy Guy Leaper, great fucking guy, and and um and he takes me back to a day in time of my life and we kind of recount just like he mm -hmm. did in his book. I kind of followed his timeline. Mm -hmm. So my book takes place primarily wow. me being in rehab. So that's why I think a lot of people mm -hmm. think. And then I'm I, I'm 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 uh, released. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I complete the treatment center, and I have a plan to go get high one more time before I check into this sober mm -hmm. house. So it it you know what I mean? How'd you get the courage to talk about stuff like that? I just never gave a fuck. You just, Dude, I went on Howard Stern's show mm -hmm. and lick Richard Christie's asshole <laughs> while he had a hemorrhoid on it. <laughs> And, but what gotcha. they didn't understand <laughs> is that I, I went on the Howard Stern show talking about how one time I was um, so high. I, I, during a, a period of time, mm -hmm. I, was, I met a pharmacist and he would sell me a bottle of a thousand Xanax mm -hmm. right from the pharmacy. And I'm doing heroin, but I'm selling a lot of Xanax. And I go to rehab and I tell them that I'm only coming off of heroin. And I guess I don't even think about the Xanax being a problem because I have a hands full of them. Yeah. And around five, six days into this, Caesar. it sets in, and I'm starting to uh, psychosis. I'm becoming delusional. I'm thinking that people are trying to sleep, are, are sleeping with my girlfriend in the rehab, mm -hmm. even though it's all men's rehab, <laughs> ripping their clothes up. I'm feeding this imaginary pig that's following me around that I named Minson. I'm putting peanuts on the ground. They kick me out of the treatment center. I go home. My mother takes me to the hospital. They give me a spinal tap, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what the fuck's wrong with me. They realize that it's Xanax, and they have to give me Xanax to come off the Xanax. So mm -hmm. I'm like a danger to myself. I'm still feeding this imaginary pig. Mm -hmm. My mother is like sleeping in bed with me to make sure I don't hurt myself. And one night I come to and I try to like, I think it's a woman in bed with me and I start to like fucking make moves on her. Oh my God. She jumps up, That's runs out. Yeah. It's like she jumps up, runs out, locks the door. I'm it's your mother. So I go on Howard Stern. I like tell those stories. Um, but what they don't know is when I'm doing this shit, like Howard Stern's show, and I lick Rick, Richard Christie's asshole mm -hmm. on live on fucking national air mm -hmm. um, on Sirius Satellite Radio, which is uncensored, mm -hmm. which is why I could do it. I Before I went on that show, I knew that he had like the number one show of all times. Being the strung out junkie that yeah, I I'm am, do the I hit up all my people that own businesses. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yo, if I say your name on the Howard Stern show, you give me $1,000. Wow. So I banked like 12 grand in a fucking 30 minute episode <laughs> and licked Richard Christie's <laughs> asshole, which got me like another two grand. I walked out of it 15 grand. Oh, yeah. So you think I'm a fucking depraved, derelict but fucking junkie, grand. but I'm like, yeah. bitch, I just made 15 mm -hmm. grand wow. all the way to the dope fucking house. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so, so I say all that to say, that my life has literally been an open book way mm -hmm. before it and became an open, an open book. book. Yeah. Interesting. And that that's why, you know, that step work shit, people mm -hmm. are always scared, like, oh, the four step. I'm like, I talked about like mm -hmm. letting men blow me for heroin and trying to fuck my mom. Like, <laughs> I, in, in, my mother is my number one person mm -hmm. in this world. I That's the woman that I would, I'm the biggest mama's boy in the mm -hmm. world. But it's just, thank, you know what's funny is that I didn't know then what God was doing for me until I did, mm -hmm. which was allowing me to build this really big platform with millions of followers to then be blessed with sobriety, to now use that very same platform I built through those ridiculous drug-filled antics to, to say, like, if anyone's out there that needs help, here's my number. Reach me directly. You know, crazy. defects turn to assets. Mm -hmm. It was all such by design, man. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm so grateful to be a part of it. And now James Frey, the guy who wrote that book, mm -hmm. and him and I are like great friends. It's crazy. So when I read it, 
my thing about his book, so like Anthony Kiedis Scar Tissue, when I read that book, he talks hardcore about the 12 step program. Yeah. And that's how I got introduced to it. Fuck I, yeah. I read James Frank. Whereas now, if they would have followed the traditions yeah, exactly. and never would have talked about yeah. that, you would have still be robbing people with their pills, fucking exactly. crackhead, menace to society. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So it's like, you know, I don't think the. And the, him doing that did not destroy AA. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's still going. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I think back in the day, they didn't want people to specifically say program because it was so small that they didn't want you to think you're the face of the program. Totally. I don't think anyone thinks that. that That's what my sponsor says. like, dude, don't flatter yourself, sweetheart. You're Every not HBO show has an AA meeting in it. Totally. These days. Yeah. But um, I read Anthony Kiedis' book and I found the program. When I read James Frey's book, I was in ninth grade. I had just started smoking crack. I was addicted to opiates. He was talking about withdrawing. He was talking about drug dreams. Bro, I'm crying. Like I, yeah. have, I didn't even know what drug dreams were because I would have these vivid crack dreams, and I didn't even know sure. like why there was what what's happening to me. I'm reading the book, and when I finish the book, he talks about how like he just has like this wine cooler that he just like babies the whole time, but he doesn't drink it. Mm-hmm. And then when he, when the book's over, I'm like, but what do I do? I'll never forget like his the, the dentist scene. Remember the dentist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's and crazy. that's so when I wrote my first book, Dream Seller, I wrote that under the influence mm-hmm. of bottle after bottle of red wine and sniffing endless amounts of line <laughs> of cocaine. Like it made me very descriptive mm-hmm. because of that book. So I'd write fucking five pages about how you sat with your head cocked to mm-hmm. the left, with your knees slightly bent and mm-hmm. the fucking skull on your shirt, before I even said what your name was or the relevance mm-hmm. of your story. Yeah. Because of his style yeah. of writing. He's and then they turned it into a movie. Did you see the movie? No, there's a James Frey movie. Yeah. It's great. It's it's good, but I you watch. and I are fans yeah. of the book and the movie's never mm-hmm. as good as the book. I even read a second one. Yeah. Uh, my friend Leonard. My friend Leonard so and good. then Pink Ashtray. I read Pink Ashtray too. My friend Leonard was good. Pink Ashtray, uh what mm-hmm. but I'm I'm a I'm his number one fan. Wow, that's crazy. I love him. Shout out to James Frey. What's he like? Just fucking really he's uh He's just a really unique guy. He and he's not a 12-step guy, right? No, no, but yeah. he, he is. A, he was going. He started to go. He started to go. That's cool. During the time, and I'm not going to get into it, but like mm-hmm. that Me Too movement. Mm-hmm. He, Let me ask you about Bam. Mm-hmm. So with Bam, it's so crazy how the tables have turned. Mm-hmm. So it's like now he's been using... It's so crazy, like watching his social media and like, you know, as a kid, it's like, dude, that was like my childhood. So it's like you see him now and it's like, what has it been like to be a friend to somebody who's going through addiction like that? Everybody gets a turn, right? And it depends on how I look at the situation. And they told me in treatment, if I changed my perception, I could change my world. And now what I see to be true is that my best friend extended a hand and helped me, even mm-hmm. when his loved one said, don't do it, don't fuck with him, he'll hurt you, he'll steal from you, he'll lie to you, he'll rob you, which all those things I did. Mm-hmm. And he still helped me in spite of myself um full circle moment he gets to a point where he's in a position he can't get out of and i'm helping him i was helping him um when he wanted me to help him when he didn't want me to help him when he when he talked bad to me about me i i i I, despite anything of how i might felt i did the right thing and i believe that I, i my firm believer is i i went through what i went through to be who I am today, to help those who are where I once was. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I get it now. I get why he was so frustrated with me. I get why he was so hurt by me and so sad by my actions and and my addiction because Mm -hmm. I've I've experienced those same things with him, Mm -hmm. you know? And right now, uh, I believe he's doing good. I believe he's sober. That's Uh, awesome. It's what he says on the social media. And one way I can tell is by the way he skates and he's skating a lot and that's, that's cool. a telltale sign yeah to you're me. not skating when you're using yeah it. not like just pick the board up pose a quick fucking mm-hmm. photo like he's skating skating do you still skate yeah you still yeah, skate a lot dude. not a well i'm 45 now mm-hmm. it doesn't pay the bills and i'm insanely busy mm-hmm. but what i've learned is that it's the only thing that quiets this fucking thing mm-hmm. my brain it shuts everything off and it allows me to really be in that moment. So I really try to schedule times to like do it and take mm-hmm. trips. Yeah, I started doing it again when I had like five years clean. I did like this inner child thing, and it was like try to find something you love before drugs. Mm-hmm. And I would be like, well, I would skate a little bit, you know. So I would, I would try to make time to do it because, 
you know, sometimes I forget, like, you know, there's still fun things you can do. You get so obsessed with work that you just kind of lose track of that. Yeah, it's all, dude, it's f finding that thing from my mental health because mm -hmm. I'll go insane. I need outlets. Mm -hmm. So now I'm really big into the gym. I'm really big into, like, um, making a conscious effort to eat healthier, mm -hmm. um, just taking care of myself. Uh, yeah. Are you still tight with Steve-O? Yeah, he's, wow. I just saw him uh, like, like a month or two ago. I did his mm -hmm. podcast, oh, so sick. I've been doing a handful of podcasts to promote my new treatment center mm -hmm. that I just opened. Yeah, let's talk about it. But um, yeah, I, you know, it's funny with Steve-O. He's so transformed that there was a point in time where I was like going to ask him to sponsor me because mm -hmm. like I, I, he inspires me on a daily basis in so many other ways than just recovery. Recovery is recovery. He's like really transcendent as a human being mm. and makes the world a better place in so many ways besides, but it's all related to recovery. Mm -hmm. Why? But like, he's just fucking inspiring. But I was like, dude, if I ask him to sponsor me, I have to commit to like really do like, he's like, you know, really like he practices mm -hmm. fucking like the program, mm -hmm. like in every area of his life where there's some that I'm just like, ah, I'm cool mm -hmm. with like not really tapping into this it's area. It's crazy that he's like this vegan now. Yeah. Everything. <laughs> everything. Crazy. Everything. You're just like, you know, it's just wild to see. It's like, dude, the guy that you just thought was the most shot out human being as a kid is, doesn't eat meat. And it's, that's the inspiring thing about it. Mm hmm. Right, I've since then cut out like red meat. I only do chicken and fish, and not because of him, but mm -hmm. because I like stayed sober long enough that I have this life that I really mm -hmm. believe is worth living for. And not that anything's wrong with red meat, but I watched something and I was like, ah, oh, I see the benefits in mm -hmm. it. And yeah, and now I like take care of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I go to the doctors. I have mm -hmm. checkups. What? Uh, how long you had this treatment center for? I opened in May of last year, mm -hmm. so we're coming up on one year sober. Awesome. I mean, one, <laughs> one year coming up open. on one year of being opened, mm -hmm. and um, it's I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm there when I'm not traveling. I'm there every day of the week. Mm -hmm. I run 9 a.m. group every morning. That's um, crazy. I really got out of... It's crazy. You would think that I'm more entrenched in the business aspect of things, mm -hmm. opening my own treatment center. But now it's allowed me to really get out of the business side of things and be like operational hands on. Yeah. Of mm -hmm. just like running the groups and working with the clients and and not, you know, it's funny. I came into AA as like a king mm -hmm. and I worked my way up the ladder to become a humble servant. Mm. And now like that's what I love the most is to just help these guys and girls and mm -hmm. it's so fulfilling to me to see like their lives come back their their families come back into the picture mm -hmm. and all because the majority of them come to my program because i'm there and mm -hmm. they were inspired by my story mm -hmm. and i'm like accessible you're there i i yeah. run groups every day mm -hmm. you know i'm not like behind a desk or behind an office that you can't get to and mm -hmm. 10 people in between it's like I'm the first guy that they see when they come into group mm -hmm. in the morning. And I, and I love it, man. It's it's Yeah, I tell people that uh, working in treatment is like uh, people who like restore old cars. It's just so cool to see someone come in like totally disheveled and like no hope. And it's crazy how much change people have in 30 days. It's like we've had clients come in who couldn't talk. We thought they had wet brain in a wheelchair, shaking. You know, their whole family said no way they're going to get sober. And 30 days later, like, dude, they're playing volleyball on the beach and they're just like yeah. a different person. And that's the thing. Like, I, I, I don't come professing that I have the answer to anything. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I do not. I don't come to act as if I know this knowledge that you're not privy to. What I know is my story and my narrative. Mm -hmm. And I'm married to it because it's mine and it worked for me. And... um so I, I walk this journey with them arm in arm. And, and if, if, if they want to buy into what I'm, I'm talking about, mm -hmm. then awesome. If not, cool. My whole goal and objective, however we get to this point, is to get you to a place that you believe is worth waking up and getting out of bed for every morning and looking forward to the day. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's fucking 
you wanting to do MAT and me taking mm-hmm. you to the fucking program to get your dose, I'll drive you. Mm-hmm. Like, who am I to say what the right or wa- mm-hmm. wrong way to a guide of a happier life is? That's fucking not realistic to my approach. I'm not knocking anyone that does, but that's my approach to, to really meet you where you're at in that. I always say it's kind of like an MTV Unplugged like concert setting is very intimate it's personal and and we and my team who i've i've carefully carefully picked mm-hmm. um will 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 tailor your recovery around you um because at this day and age everyone says you know addicts will die mm-hmm. you know you get high you could die yes that's true but today it's very true with fentanyl and and that whole deal and trank that like <laughs> it's crazy it's insane so i legit will meet them where they're at and and i come to this as a form of like it's weird most treatment centers uh, and i'm not saying that's wrong i've adopted the policies of the 12 step program that i got sober in and what's the require what's the what's the third tradition only the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop, to stop. and that's how i approach you come into treatment man mm-hmm. like we'll we'll figure it out yeah i'll do the best that i can mm-hmm. you know because again looking back when i thought these failure attempts of getting sober weren't mm-hmm. i know so many people are like well why would i go to treatment i've already been so that's what I said for so long. So crazy. I was that guy. And like you said. I've already been to treatment. Nothing. You're not going to tell me anything different with treatment center number 13 mm-hmm. that they missed at 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, or 1. Mm-hmm. Facts. You're not. They're going to say the same thing. Same thing. Mm-hmm. I remember Bam, after my last treatment center, he didn't understand it at the time. Mm-hmm. He came to me. He's like, what the fuck was different about 13? Why not 10, 8, 6? He's like, did you have like a meeting with God or something? And I wanted to say, yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't get into that with him because it's just a lot to grasp. Mm-hmm. But that's, you know, it takes what it takes until it takes. Mm -hmm. And who are you or I to say what it will be for it to take? That's between you and Mm -hmm. your maker. Yeah, it's like, you know, if you've been trying to get in shape and you go to different gyms, like, they're not inventing new machines. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They've been the same machines for like 40 years. Nothing's changing. And it's like, dude, it's like press and pull and cardio and that's it. The only time we fail is when we quit trying to quit. Mm -hmm. And that was why I got sober, because I was relentless. I knew Mm -hmm. I was going to die or get sober. I was never content with just living with a needle hanging out of my arm. And I will say that not everyone needs to go to treatment, but treatment gives you a real fighting chance. Fuck yeah. It's so hard to get, what do you do, just not quit on your couch? And most people don't have the luxury to go to treatment. Mm -hmm. So people like refuse to go to treatment is like crazy, because there's like 10,000 people in your city that mm-hmm. would die to go to a rehab. But know? tell that to me while I'm getting yeah. high. It's yeah. like, who the fuck cares? I mm-hmm. get it. I'm great at playing devil's advocate because yeah. I've seen me do all the shit that they're yeah. going to do. Mm-hmm. And I understand it. And you know, again, how deep do you want to go down that rabbit hole? Mm-hmm. Maybe it takes those X amount of people with treatment or with, with the ability to go to treatment to not go to treatment mm-hmm. to God forbid, unfortunately, become one of those casualties. I travel all around. How do we lift the stigma? Well, unfortunately, the stigma is lifting because the death toll is rising, hence mm-hmm. us being here having this conversation. So even I meet mothers and I'm like, your child's death was not in vain. Mm-hmm. It's created this conversation that we're having that allowed me the ability to get sober and open a treatment center. Like how I, I believe, I believe, and people think I'm insane sometimes, that everything is exactly as it's supposed to be. It's all God intended. I believe heroin is God. I believe death is God. I believe birth is God. I believe life is God. I believe God is everything, Mm -hmm. personally. That's just my opinion. Who the fuck am I to think I have figured out? (laughs) I agree to have the same belief. You know? And acceptance is the answer to everything in our program. Mm -hmm. I know. That's it. It all comes back to acceptance. Mm -hmm. I know that. Well, hey, I want to appreciate you coming on the this show. This is fun, dude. This I is can awesome. Talk I know. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, this I don't. is like what gets me high and <laughs> yeah. gets me fucking off. Mm-hmm. It's awesome, man. I love uh, meeting someone that's like minded, and uh, I just want to say again, like, it's so cool to see somebody that is like, you know, super program, down to earth, relatable, and there's not a lot of us in the spotlight that you really get to see. Like, I have friends sure. who have amazing stories. I'm like, you want to do the podcast? They're like, nah. Sure. You know, not everyone yeah. wants to tell their story in front of I everybody, know. you know? And so. I'm like, why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're like, well, anonymity. I'm like, yeah. fuck anonymity. Like, I have kids. I'm like, all right, whatever. <laughs> so, you, know. you couldn't have had those kids without your surprise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always tell them, all right, bro, addicts are going to die. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, my, my, the chick in my book mm-hmm. who is named Alexia mm-hmm. in, in Dream Seller, She's a major role, and people mm-hmm. ask me all the time. And her and I split ways, and then she got clean before I did. And uh, 
and I see her and, and, and um, she refuses to do any kind of interview. And I'm like, dude, do you know how many people you would inspire? Yeah. Like, and she's like, and, and I know. I'm like, ah, but I accept mm -hmm. it. <laughs> I have to. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you, bro. Thank hey, you so man, much. Hey, man, I love you. Thanks you so for this much. talk. Love this you was too, great, bro. Thank man. You. Anybody out there, man, check out Redemption. But if you need me, call me personally, 610-314-6747. Myself or my employee, John, will answer that call and get you the fucking help you deserve. Say it again. 610-314-6747. There you go. Thank you, appreciate bro. Appreciate you. Appreciate you.